Hi, second grade. It is time for chapter 13 of The Indian in the Cupboard. Remember, they were just caught at school by the headmaster. Art and accusation. Mr. Johnson opened and shut his mouth for several seconds without a sound coming out. At last he croaked, uh, Mrs. Hunt, uh, I, I'm afraid I'm unwell. I, I'm going home to bed. Will you take charge of this child? His voice dropped to a mumble like an old man's. Omri just caught the words uh, back to their lessons. Then Mr. Johnson let go of Patrick's arm, turned, walked most unsteadily to the door, and then put his hands on it and swayed as if he might fall over. Uh, Mr. Johnson, said Mrs. Hunt in a shocked tone, shall I call a taxi? No, no, I'll be all right. And the headmaster, without looking back, tottered out into the corridor. Well, exclaimed Mrs. Hunt, whatever have you been doing to the poor man? Neither of them answered. Omri was staring at Patrick, or rather at his pocket. Patrick's shoulders were heaving and he was not looking at anybody. Mrs. Hunt was obviously flummoxed. Well, you'd better go to the toilet and wash your faces, both of you, and then go back to your classroom as fast as you can toddle, she said in her funny old-fashioned way. Run along. They needed no second telling. Neither of them said a word until they were in the boys' toilet. Patrick went straight to a basin and began running cold, the cold water. He splashed some onto his face, getting his collar soaked. Omri stood watching him. Obviously, he was as upset as Omri, if not more so. Once again, Omri felt their friendship trembling on the edge of destruction. He drew a deep breath. You showed him, he said at last in a trembling voice. Patrick said nothing. He dried his face on the roller towel. He was still gasping the way one does when he's been crying. Give them back to me, both of them. Patrick reached slowly into his pocket. He put his closed hand backward. Omri looked as his fingers slowly opened. Little Bear and Boone were sitting there absolutely terrified. They were actually clinging on to each other. Even Little Bear was hiding his face and they were both trembling. With infinite slowness and care, so as not to frighten them more, Omri took them into his own hand. It's all right, he whispered, bringing them near to his face. Please, it's, it's all right. Then he put them carefully in his pocket and said to Patrick in a low voice, you stupid fool. Patrick turned. His face gave Omri more of a jolt than Mr. Johnson's had. It was white, molded red, with swollen eyes. I had to, he said, I had to. He'd have phoned my dad. They'd have made me tell in the end. Anyhow, he didn't believe in them. He thought he was seeing things. He just stood there gaping at them. He didn't even touch them. When they moved, he gave a yell, and then I thought he was going to fall over. He went white as a ghost. You saw, he didn't believe his eyes, Omri. Honest, he'll think he dreamed it. Omri went on looking at him stonily. Can't I, can't I have Boone? Asked Patrick in a small voice. No. Please, I, I'm sorry I told, I had to. They're not safe with you. You use them. They're people. You can't use people. Patrick didn't ask again. He gave one more hiccuping sob and went out. Omri took the little men out of his pocket again and lifted them to his face. Boone was lying flat on his front, holding his big hat down over his ears as if trying to shut out the world. But Little Bear stood up. Big man shout, give fear, he said angrily. Small ears, big noise, no good. I know, I'm sorry, said Omri, but it's okay now. I'm going to take you home. What about wife? His promise. Omri had forgotten all about that. Another Indian, another live little person to worry about. Omri had heard about people going gray-haired almost overnight if they had too much worry. He felt it might easily happen to him. He thought back to the time only a few days ago when this had all started, and he had fondly imagined it was all going to be the greatest fun anybody had ever had. Now he realized that it was more like a nightmare. But Little Bear was looking at him challengingly. He had promised. Right after school, he said, we'll go to the shop. There was still another hour of lessons to be got through. Fortunately, it was two periods of art. In the art room, you could go away into the corner and even sit with your back turned to the teacher if you liked. Omri went to the farthest and darkest corner. Omri, don't try to draw there, said the art teacher. You're in your own light. It's bad for your eyes. I'm going to draw something huge anyway, said Omri. 
All the others sat near the long windows. He was quite alone. And if the teacher approached him, he would hear her feet on the bare floor. He suddenly felt he must, he simply must get a little fun out of this somehow. He cautiously fished little Baron Boone out of his pocket. They stood on the sheet of white drawing paper as if on a stretch of snow and looked about them. This school place? Asked little Bear. Yes. Shh. Sure. Don't look much like the school I went to, exclaimed Boone. Where's the rows of desks? Where's the slate and bit of chalk? Why ain't the teacher talking? We're doing art. We can just sit where we like. She doesn't talk much. She just lets us get on with it, replied Omri in the softest whisper he could possibly manage. Art, eh? Asked Boone, brightening up. Say, that was my best subject. I was allus on top of art. Only thing I wasn't any good at. Still draw a mite when I gets a chance, if it ain't nobody around to laugh at me. He reached into the pocket of his own tiny jeans and fished out a stub of pencil, almost too small to see. Can I draw a mite on your paper? he asked. Omri nodded. Boone strode to the very center of the paper, looked all around at the white expanse stretching away from him in every direction, and gave a deep sigh of satisfaction. Then he knelt down and began to draw. Little Bear and Omri watched. From the microscopic point of Boone's pencil, there developed a most amazing scene. It was a prairie landscape with hills and cacti and a few tufts of sagebrush. Boone sketched in with most with sure strokes some wooden buildings such as Omri had often seen in cowboy films, a saloon with a swinging sign reading Golden Dollar Saloon in twirly writing, a post office and general store, a livery stable, and a stone house with a barred window and a sign saying jail. Then, moving swiftly on his knees as if it were from one end of a street to another, Boone drew in the foreground figures of men and women, wagons, horses, dogs, and all the trappings of a little town. From Boone's point of view, he was drawing something quite large, making the best use of his vast piece of paper. But from Omri's, the drawing was minute, perfect in its detailing, but smaller than any human hand could possibly have made. He and Little Bear watched fascinated. Boone, you're an artist, Omri breathed at last. When Boone had even made the mud on the unpaved street look real, Little Bear grunted. But not like real place, he said. Boone didn't trouble to answer. In fact, he was so absorbed he probably didn't hear. But Omri frowned. Then he understood, of course. Boone's town was part of an America that was not thought of during Little Bear's time. Boone, he whispered, bending his ear down. What year is it in your town, your time? Uh, last time I saw a newspaper, it was 1889, said Boone. There, that's my drawing. Not bad, huh? It's absolutely brilliant, said Omri, enthralled. Omri! Omri jumped. His two hands instantly cupped themselves over the two men. From the other side of the room, the teacher said, I see it's no use trying to stop you chattering. You even do it when you're alone. Bring me your picture. For a moment, Omri hesitated, but it was too marvelous to be passed up. He scooped the men into his pocket and picked up the sheet of paper. For once, he wouldn't stop to think. He'd just enjoy himself. He carried Boone's drawing to the teacher and put it innocently into her hand. What happened then made up for a good deal of the worry and general upset the little men had caused him. First, she just glanced. At a glance, the drawing in the middle of the paper just looked like a scribble or a smudge. I thought you said you were going to do something huge, she said with a laugh. This isn't much more than a, and then she took a second, much closer look. She stared without speaking for about two minutes while Omri felt inside him the be beginnings of a huge, gleeful, uncontrollable laugh. Abruptly, the teacher, who had been perched on a desk, stood up and went to a cupboard. Omri was not surprised to see a magnifying glass in her hand when she turned around. She put the paper down on a table and bent over it with the glass poised. She examined the drawing for several minutes more. Her face was something to see. Some of the nearest children had become aware that something unusual was going on and were also craning to see what the teacher was looking at so attentively. Omri stood with the same innocent look on his face, waiting, the laugh slowly rising inside him. Fun, this was fun, if you liked. This was what he'd been imagining. The teacher looked at him. Her face was not quite as stunned as Mr. Johnson's had been, but it was an absolute picture of bafflement. Omri, she said, how in the name of all that's holy did you do this? I like drawing small, said Omri, quite truthfully. Small? This isn't small, it's tiny. It's 
infinitesimal. It's microscopic. Her voice was rising higher with every word. Several of the other children had now stood up and were crowding around the paper, peering at it in an absolute stupefaction. Small gasps and exclamations of wonder were rising on all sides. Omri's held in laugh threatened to explode. The teacher's eyes were now narrow with astonishment and doubt. Show me, she said, the pencil you used. This took Omri aback, but only for a second. I left it over there. I'll just go and get it, he said sweetly. He walked back to his table, his hand in his pocket. With his back turned, he bent over, apparently searching the top of the table. Then he turned around smiling, holding something cupped in his hand. He walked back. Here it is, he said, and held out his hand. Everyone bent forward. The art teacher took hold of his hand and pulled it toward her. Are you putting me on, Omri? There's nothing there. Yes, there is. She peered close until he could feel her warm breath on his hand. Don't breathe hard, said Omri, his laugh now trembling on his very lips. You'll blow it away. Maybe you'd see it better through the magnifying glass, he added kindly. Slowly, she raised the glass into position. She looked through it. Can I see? Is it there? Can I look? Clamored the other children, all except Patrick. He was sitting by himself, not paying attention to the crowd around Omri. The art teacher lowered the glass. Her eyes were dazed. I don't believe it. It's there. How did you pick it up? Ah, uh, well, that's a bit of a secret method I have. Yes, she said. Yes, it must be. And you wouldn't feel like telling us? No, said Omri in a trembly voice. His laugh was on the verge. It was going to burst out. May I be excused? Yes, she said in a dazed voice. Go on. He took the drawing back and tottered to the door. He managed to get outside before the laugh actually blew out, but it was so loud, so overpowering that he was obliged to go right out into the playground. There he sank onto a bench and laughed till he felt quite weak. Her face, he had never enjoyed anything so much in his whole life. It had been worth it. The bell rang, school was over. Omri brought out the men and held them up. Guys, he said, I enjoyed that. Thank you. Now we're going to the shop. Omri ran all the way to Yaps and got there before most other children had even got out of school. In 10 minutes, the place would be full of kids buying potato chips and sweets and toys and comics. Just now he had it to himself and he had to make the most of the few minutes he had.